kind of weird just watching the numbers come and listening to the snow blower outside and staring at a screen. Oh well. All right, welcome to the webinar. We are starting in three minutes, waiting for everything to get together here. We have a lovely snowy day in Anchorage. Well, lovely if you don't have to drive in it. Everybody who is a skier is happy. All right, so I hear that I'm good to begin. And here we go with this wonderful, flexible, special person interview. I'm Michelle Whaley, and I'm very happy to be talking with you today. It's one of my favorite topics. Uh, the alternate title is How to Talk with Students from Day One. Now I need to click on the right thing. So the last time I gave a talk on the special person interview, I got about 10 minutes in and I had a person raise her hand and she said, what is this we're talking about? What is the special person interview? And that was my aha moment when I realized, ah, not everybody knows about what the special person interview is. Well, uh, there are other names of it. Uh, one is called the star of the day. Um, people call it, well, I call it our star. And really it's a portal for comprehensible input. And when I say a portal, I mean one of these strategies that everybody has been hearing about, one word stories, storytelling, uh, story listening, um, clip chat, write and discuss, any of those are portals that you will use comprehensible input with. So this is just one more way, and I confess that it is about my favorite way. Well, it's one of my favorite ways to deliver comprehensible input to my students. Um, and that is because it's just so easy to do. Uh, Bryce Hedstrom is the person who started me off on this adventure of using personal interviews. I watched him at some conference and just was absolutely shocked at how wonderful he was because he interviewed people and they followed along and they knew what he was saying and he had a whole bunch of different ways to follow up. So the special person interview is an interview in front of a class or not necessarily when students and teachers learn about each other and just magically seem to acquire language. I can say that last night I had a brand new beginner in my already beginning Russian class and we spent the first half hour just interviewing him. And I told him from the beginning that he just had to relax and enjoy being the star of the day and he was fine. So I, I love this system. Um, but before we really start, I just want to remind anybody who's using comprehensible input that the star of the day uses particular CI skills. Now, Terry Waltz recently put out a blog post on what are the five most important skills with CI. And that's been something I was thinking about lately too. Um, Anna Gilcher and Rochelle Adams got me to understand last summer that there really is a divide. You've got strategies and you've got the tools that you use to present those strategies. So what are those? Well, the first one is that you have to use visuals, gestures, and your first language, if you have a shared first language, to establish meaning. Okay, you have to establish meaning. And in the picture that I have there, you can see that I am pointing at the words that somebody could use, but also that the phrases that I'm asking and in an interview are already up on the board. So that the student, if she doesn't remember what something means, or if she's brand new that day, she has no question about what that question means. Now, the next thing that Susie Gross is always kind of pounded into my head is that you have to check for comprehension. You can do that in any number of ways. 
simply by saying, what did I just say? Or what did, what did this word mean? Um, or by just seeing how quickly and readily people answer your questions, you know, did, did Shauna say that she likes to play chess? Yes or no? And if, if there isn't a really quick uh, group response, you know that something went wrong. Hand in hand with that is going slowly. And that's where I'm pointing and pausing. Pointing and pausing helps me slow down. I'm not really a very fast talker anyway, but when I am speaking Russian, I use that point and pause technique to slow me down. Often I have my signs in different places of the room so that I actually have to walk to them. And that helps students. You want to limit and repeat, repeat, repeat the vocabulary that you are using. And you can do that through those comprehension checks. And you can also do it by comparing students to one another while they're in your class. And then with the milking tools that you will use later on, it's another way of repeating. The last piece of all of this is that when you're interviewing students and discussing things with them in class, be interested. You have to show that you are interested. And then everybody else is too. But if you're just asking those questions kind of in drill format, well, nobody is going to be interested. So be sincerely interested. If you can't sustain your interest for a while, if you're just having an off day, don't do this. Um, so those are, those are the CI skills and tools that you really, really need to have to be able to do the star of the day. All right, beyond that, you need to keep it compelling. And so timing is critical. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you need to make sure that you don't go any longer than the students aren't just really wanting it to keep happening. Um, also, one way to keep it compelling is when students know that you are it, going to collect the information and that you will actually use it later. So that's always a good thing. Um, just make sure that the information about the students shows up in little bits and pieces later on. Okay, and finally, you want to milk it. Definitely you're talking with the students, you're comparing them, but then you want to follow up. If you are doing anything in class, you want to use it as much as you can because you put effort into doing it, make it worthwhile, keep milking, milking it as long as you can as long as it's interesting. So writing, reading, playing games with it, you can do it all. So, um, Bryce Hedstrom, who gave me this whole thing, has a wonderful, wonderful website. And you can look at his step of the progress, of the process, and if you go here, you could actually just go to Bryce's website and not listen to me at all for the rest of the time. because. This lays it out pretty darn well. And I definitely used his steps and followed them for a long time with my high school classes. Uh, one of the things that I have to point out is that sometimes you don't want to do it all, but isn't that true? Whenever you watch what somebody else does or you have a lesson plan that somebody else has presented, you mess with it your own way. Uh, so Bryce gives you such a clear introduction to how to do the special person interview. And I highly recommend following it or at least reading all about it and then, then tweaking it to match your own needs. Um, I do have a few tips that are possibly on top of Bryce's information. And I always want to say that I don't have any new ideas. Almost everything I know has come from somebody else at some point. And I will be trying to credit the really obvious ones and the most recent ones, but I have learned from so many great teachers that it's possible that I should just say, I'm really sorry in advance because I may have forgotten where I got something from. Uh, on this page, for example, is a nice skinny strip that I ended up using because Lori Clark brought me her teacher's discovery stuff last summer and she put it into the room where I was teaching beginning Spanish and it just changed both them and me 
when we were doing special person interviews, I could just point at these. It was a skinny poster. I didn't have posters all over the room that I had to run to, even though that is sometimes a good idea for me. And it, they helped out a lot. And people felt really, really confident they could look up and use those words. So these are the Super 7 that Terry Waltz came up with originally. And everybody in the world uses them. But I have to say, I love this little poster. And I have kind of copied it for my Russian classes. Um, another set of tips is that you really do have to work with students. You have to tell them at the outset of these interviews that they need to be kind. And I really like responsive classroom for the classroom management tips about setting kids up with modeling to begin with. So I pretend to be a student, sort of pretend to be both a student and the teacher in the room, and I model how I would respond to their answers. And then I ask the class, so what did you notice about how I asked, how I responded to the way that Olivia was talking? Um, so I have started by putting a really strong, confident student in the front of the classroom first because I want, I want everybody to see that they can be strong like that. But then I am going to make it very clear that this is a safe environment. We are all going to be supporting. So my little first graders will say something like, oh, you smiled at her when she answered. And somebody else says, you didn't laugh. And um, then somebody, the kids know about these things. Oh, you made eye contact with her. Yes, I was supportive. I'm positive. And then I tell those kids who are being interviewed that they, first of all, they don't have to answer any question that they don't want to answer. And secondly, the truth is not required. So as you might see later on in an example, some kids are wildly untruthful. The only rule there is that then they have to remain untruthful in that same way for the rest of the semester or year or however long I'm going to have them. With my current kids, I may have them for four years. So, well, or six years, I guess. So if they're starting off with me in kindergarten and they want to say that they have 17 giraffes at home, either they need to provide reasons for those giraffes to be coming and going, or they need to just keep that same answer because I don't want to have to learn new stuff. Um, so, you try to set their minds at ease. You can say you don't have to complete, you don't have to talk in full sentences, one word's enough. That's what I did with my brand newbie last night. Um, I, he looked like he was going to try to make full sentences somehow without knowing any Russian. But, you know, I said, no, you can just tell us in one word where you're from or, um, or what instrument you play. Don't, don't try to go any farther. Uh, Stephen Krashen's effective filter hypothesis actually says that if students are not comfortable in a language, their acquisition will slow down or stop. Okay, I'm going to stop here for just a second mention that I am going to do um, questions and answers at the very end, and I promise that I will. Um, Erin, who's watching this, is going to send me a text if she thinks that it's really necessary for me to stop. and answer a question, but I promise I'll look at them. And if I don't get them there, I'll answer you by email. Okay. All right. Another tip is that I assign a record keeper for each of my classes. Well, not K through second grade. That's a little bit of a problem, but I can talk about that later. Um, I keep one book for all of my classes. I have just uh, that one book that has all my language groups, both Spanish and Russian, that is, and um, sometimes when I'm doing something with another group in English, I ask the record keepers to date and label with their class names so that I don't get confused. They need to use a new page for each one. And that way, interviews and quizzes and stories and everything's all in one place, and I don't have to go looking for it. I really like doing that. And I can carry it around with me. Um, Sometimes people say, oh, can I just take it home so that I can type because I have my heritage speakers type these things up or my aides or 
whoever, you know, just a most advanced kids. But nowadays we have pictures and if they don't have a camera or a, a phone with a camera, I can take a picture and send it to their parents and then they can type it up at home. So that is really useful and it is the one book that I never want to lose. So they get very full pretty fast, but it's a useful thing to have. All right, um, engagement is everything. So I truly like to start all classes with something resembling a star of the day interview. And in the past, I have managed to go for an entire semester only on this information. Um, nowadays, I seem to be working my personal interview into an awful lot of other areas. And so the person who's recording notes is always writing the story and then a little bit of a fact about a person who's that day, the, who's the person being interviewed that day, but also information about the rest of the class. Still, the little guys here are listening to somebody give a talk and or being answering questions and um, they last up to 10 minutes even in preschool um, some classes can last for 30 minutes some classes can last for 90. i've had a lot of students in my life that they whisper on the way out the door oh man we kept her talking on that interview for the entire period and we didn't have to do any russian so i i love it when they think that our speaking in Russian all period long is wasting time because as you know, it is not. So um, timing is not the most important thing because if it is not engaging, stop it before it gets that way. Um, your students are always special, but sometimes they're just too wiggly and you need to do something else. Uh, Erica Piplinski gave a talk on this same series and she said something that I just loved hearing about this and I think if you look at the picture of these kids it really shows that our brains light up when we are dealing with our favorite topics and one of those and our favorite topic for almost all of us is ourselves so little guys they're typically waiting until they can ask a question about uh, or that when they can answer a question about themselves, because I do compare everybody. Um, there's just uh, one kind of class in which the star of the day does not work for me, and that is when I have a single online student. I can do the special person or star of the day interview with two students, I can do it with three, I can do it with 35. I can't seem to do it very well with just one person because there aren't enough people to compare it to and not enough people to bounce things off of. So um, I'm going to overcome this and I will be able to do it with one person, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay, another tip is to make sure when you are doing the interview that you make it something that everybody covets. And that is by making it both easy as I've already mentioned, make sure that they understand everything and make sure that it's special. So not only do you have your language support, but you might have a special chair or bean bag. And, and no matter what, you have lots and lots of kudos. You have um, uh, Martina Becks on her Comprehensible Classroom, Teachers Pay Teachers. She has a, a whole slideshow and she includes a wonderful certificate. Now. I'm not organized enough to have those copies with me, and so I have not actually used them, but it's a great idea. And this little girl is talking about her family and what they like to do, and visuals are always really helpful. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but in the meantime, you are, when your students are sharing themselves, they are building community and you're helping them find common ground. So you always have those kids in your life who feel like they are the quiet ones in the classroom. They are the ones who don't want to talk with others or feel that they don't have enough friends or whatever. They have, they have some issue. And when they hear 
that somebody plays the same video game that they do, or when they get to say that they play that, that video game, or when they say that they play this instrument, and turns out that other kids like the same book, the same color, the same movie, um, whatever you're asking them about. Or even if, even if they all, they're the three kids in the room who walk to school, well, now they have something in common. So it really is important to be doing that repetition, comparing all the time, even if you're still trying to keep the focus on one kid, um, because it lets everybody into a circle that is shared. So I absolutely love what comes out of these interviews. All right. Uh, Oh, yes. You, as the teacher, should also answer questions. In fact, last summer I had a, a beginning Spanish class that we had interviewed almost everybody in the class, and then they all came in one day, and they, it was like they had gathered outside the door, and they probably had. These were adults, and they came in and they said in one voice, okay, you are the star of the day today. You sit down in this special chair, and I did, and I said, but you guys don't know how to ask the questions. They said, oh, yes, we do. And they went through all of the questions with me, and I answered them. And, uh, but, you know, very often I answer the questions just as a model so that they know how the question can be answered, and that gives them the first-person forms. So, uh, and then sometimes I'll ask them, well, what do you know about me? Do you know anything? Well, that's kind of fun. Lots of people say, what questions should we use? Well, you can use any questions that are interesting that you might want to know about your students, including text questions, uh, meaning the questions that are in your textbook if you have to use a textbook. Or I have um, in the past used the questions from the Apple exam or the, at least the themes that they have so that everybody feels kind of practiced. Oh, this is going to be the theme this year and we're going to ask um, the questions. But again, you have to be really interested or, and you want to be really interested, but it gives you a way of addressing those questions to show that, oh, these aren't just things to check off. This is stuff that we want to know about each other. So having said that, don't recreate the wheel because there are lots of examples out there and you don't have to figure out what questions to ask. You can start with something that already exists. Um, I, um, as some of you know, I am a Spanish teacher who is not actually trained in Spanish and now I've been going at it for a couple of years, but man, Martina Bex's uh, star of the day or special person. I'm sorry, I don't know what she called it. Um, it was her slideshow. It saved me because I didn't even know how to ask these questions. So, you know, um, and I didn't know that anybody would know what the questions meant. And so I have the questions up and I'm always looking at them very carefully to make sure that I'm asking right. Well, that was in the beginning. Now I'm getting pretty good at that. And so you'll see that your students who feel less confident will sit so that they can look at the questions and the answers that are provided, because that's a really important thing to give the question what it means, give some potential answers, and then to give to the class ways to report about this person. So I appreciate that and I depend on it. Um, and Drea, oh, I forgot to ask permission about that one. Um, Amy Vanderdeen has one that is available on um, Bryce's page, and she did one that was for uh, elementary students, and I love this one too. It's got the question for me to remember to ask, and now that I speak Spanish a little bit better, I don't have to have the answers, but I am actually going to use this with a nursery group in Russian in the upcoming months, and I will, of course, uh, change it to Russian so that I don't get confused. But you can see that you could use a slideshow from for any age. You don't have to be really messy. This is from Anne Marie Chase and Rita Barrett, and I really liked what they did. I liked the fact that they had lots of examples, but the, otherwise it was pretty simple. Um, this one is an example of mine, which 
breaks all the rules about what on a PowerPoint you should have no more than six words per line and no more than six lines. Oh well. Uh, this is an example of one that I use with my adults uh, and I try to tell them in advance, look, look at the English, you know, look at the Russian, I'm going to read it to you, look at the English, make sure you understand it, and then I go very slowly pointing out the words and what they mean to begin with. But um, I based this one, which a whole slideshow, which was also um, Sabrina Jancic. I could be pronouncing her name wrong, but she did this amazing original slideshow that has been shared um, with everybody around the world. Um, and Bryce Hedstrom has posted these different versions of, of uh, personal interviews, special person, our star, everything in a number of different languages. So almost whatever language you have, you can find it on Bryce's page. And if your language is not there, Bryce is quite wonderfully willing to share the English with you and you can create it and then it'll be posted for the world to see. So I highly recommend going to visit his page. And it's actually kind of fun to go look at the different languages because they aren't all the same. They, they are very different and fun to use. But um, having said that, there, it, it's not really necessary to have a slideshow. You could write the questions on butcher paper if you want to. In my case, I, uh, with my young elementaries, I had them go, and I still do, I'll say, okay, go to the board and draw a picture of all your pets, and then we're going to talk about them. And so while one kid is drawing something, we're doing something else with the rest of the class, although usually they want to watch. And then I can ask them as many questions as I want about their family. I can take a picture, we can put it in the little yearbook, but I can do everything from asking, oh, I'm sorry, for, well, from asking where people in their family live to what their names are, to what they like to eat for dinner. They never know exactly what my questions might be about this family. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is, I have changed my question to from being, please draw a picture of your family to please draw a picture of the people you live with. And that has resulted in some kind of uh, um, relieved children because they often get asked about their families and they don't necessarily want to do that. And again, they don't have to tell the truth. They just have to maintain that same story for the rest of the time that they will be talking with me. So they can't suddenly acquire four new brothers. Um, if you don't have that much technology, then as I have often not had in my the school where I'm now teaching Spanish, um, this, this young lady whose hand is showing, she really likes to write on the board. So as we ask questions, she writes down the questions and then she fills in the answers. And one, this one time I decided to take a picture. I think it was because I couldn't remember when his birthday was or how old he was. And I wanted to put it in the book, but I needed it. So there was the picture. And then Lily on the other side was telling about her pets. And she is, um, she is quite the character and her pets all live inside another pet. So that is an interesting thing for me to have to explain in Spanish. Uh, also, uh, speaking of questions, use what you already have. Now, I didn't already have this, but it's a great question. Do you think that extraterrestrials really exist? It's a great addition, but it's part of the, of the free download that Christy Placido posted on Facebook yesterday from Fluency Matters. It was a prep for success units, and I went looking at them, and I thought, ooh, I don't even have to read these novels. I can just use these questions in both languages. Uh, so that's probably not exactly what Carol God wants me to be telling people about it. But those units are very cool. And then, you know, how great. Now they're ready to read a novel because you've talked through using all these structures that they need to use. So there were several that I just thought were adorable. And as a Russian teacher, I'm so jealous that all this stuff exists, but I know that I share the same problem with other less commonly taught languages. So I'm not gonna complain too much, but just know that I am complaining. 
So here was another one that was really good, I, and I haven't ever asked it. Do you look like a relative? Huh, and if so, which one? Uh, in my case, I look like my, um, my father, and, um, but he is not related to me biologically. Uh, we have the same smile, and people are always telling me that. So I love telling people, yep, I look like my father. And so it's not the truth. I mean, well, it's the truth, but it's not based on truth if that makes any sense. And then here's one from the novel 48 Hours. And I thought that the questions there were less directly relatable, mostly to the special person interview, but this is a great question. Would you eat these or would you leave them on the plate? Why? Um, you know, what a great thing to add when you're asking about favorite foods, to show something and say, hey, if you had this, what would you do? And it's, um, of course, got different grammar there that sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to start, but I could ask my second graders this same question. They would have a lot to say. So now I wanted to show you just a couple of examples in the classroom. Those of you who speak Spanish, please don't judge. But um, this, is, this first one I'm gonna show you is with a child who, doesn't like to be filmed and he doesn't like to be the center of attention, but he loves his stuffy, which is actually mine, but he gets to hold it as long as the, he and the stuffy are behaving well. So here goes. Oops, oh no, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let's see. There we go. Is that Carlos? Si, se llama Carlos. Carlos, como estas? Está feliz. Ah, está, Carlos está feliz. Mm -hmm. Que bueno. Carlos, um, clase, donde vive Carlos? Arbol. En un arbol? Es, es la verdad? Tu sí. vives en un arbol? Sí. Sí. Y donde está el arbol? In Alaska. Oh, el uh, arbol está en Alaska. Okay. That, um, the class is helping a little bit, but you might notice that I am not talking to many of the other children, partly because, um, well, when this particular kid, anyway, you understand. Sometimes there are situations in a classroom. All right, here's another one. And this is an advanced Russian classroom. And you'll notice that the student is not usually looking, but he occasionally refers. Oh, I did it again. That's really weird. Go. Okay. Hopefully it will go. So, like, um, I'm asking the students. I, I, here, I was um, asking the rest of the class the question of where this young man is from, because a lot of people in Alaska are from different places. But they had been together for four semesters, and here I was the first semester with them, and I assumed they knew each other really well. Well, I was wrong. He's Tennessee. He's Tennessee? He's Tennessee? He's not in Tennessee. He's Arkansas? I had no idea he was from Arkansas, and so I started asking him about whether it was a big city or a little city. And he said, well, all the, all the places in Arkansas are small cities. Okay, then I'm gonna switch, I don't know, let's see. Um, started asking about what he likes to do in his free time. And you can see that the pictures up there are going to help him. I asked the class to tell me what he didn't like to do. And he doesn't like swimming. Anyway. Um, Um, 
They asked the class whether they thought it was important for a person to learn how to, to, to swim in Alaska. And, okay. So, so um, you really can and should mix up special person interviews, adapt them for the age, definitely adapt them for the age, the timing, the kinds of questions that you ask. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be asking a second grader where they work, but you might want to ask, where do you think you're going to want to work when you get older, especially if that's the theme that the regular classroom is doing. Um, I like varying the routine and going beyond the special person interview. So here are some ways to do it. Um, if the groups know each other well, as I thought they did for this particular thing, um, then you probably, you can interview the class and then verify with the students. So it's another way of getting through the questions. And in this particular interview, I was surprised by a couple of things. One was, obviously, that the class didn't know each other that well. I thought, how can you go through four semesters and you don't know where people are from and how many kids they have and anything like that? And then the other thing, besides the fact that I was so nervous that I was, uh, because I was being filmed and uh, that I was forgetting words and the kids in the class were actually trying to give me words, um, the other thing that was really interesting was this young man's Russian is at a fairly high level. And I, had, I didn't notice any gra grammatical mistakes when I was interviewing him. But when I went back to watch it, I realized, oh, you know, he's still at that intermediate to even in some cases low advanced stage where it's, he, he will be making mistakes. And he's, he's really good, he's really fast, he's really fluent, but he's still making grammatical mistakes. And then the last thing that sort of surprised me was that when I first started off with these folks who were more advanced, I thought I needed to ask them the, the more advanced questions. But instead, asking them stuff like, what is right in front on that screen? Do you like your name? And then following up with something like, well, who gave you that name? I learned so much interesting stuff about these students that nobody else in the room knew. So that's another thing. All right. If you have groups who don't know each other, you can still interview the class and verify with the kid. Like here, I have this kid. Um, these, these were kindergartners at the time, and um, the one is saying that Olivia has three sisters. Meanwhile, Olivia, at the same moment, she's got her finger up saying one, and the rest of the class, they're still trying to guess, but I can say, oh, she has three sisters? Are you, is that right? Does she have three sisters? Oh, no, she doesn't have three sisters, class. What do you think? And um, at, they're still working themselves out of that sort of egocentric age when they think they know all the information and they don't know that other people might be giving some. <laughs> She's like, it's one. I have one. I have one sister. And they, we, I got all sorts of great practice with numbers because they were sure that they would answer. Um, if you have a brand new situation and you don't even have the text, as I did at the beginning of teaching Russian, a couple of classes of Russian <laughs> at university and prior uh, instructors had taken off with all of the texts, I was so nervous. But Skip Crosby saved me. He told me that what he was doing for his college Spanish classes, he was having them all send in pictures. And now anytime I have a class with that, especially adults, I ask them to send in and these are some of the pictures from that, those two first classes that I taught. And you can see that they were very interesting, but interest, yeah, interesting. And the students themselves, when we started showing these, were interested. So I posted all these pictures on one, or I had them contribute to one Google slide set. And they... Uh, we, and then we started talking about them one at a time, and I would bring up the picture, and that was the first thing that we talked about was, oh, you know, who is this in the class, and what's he doing here, and um, what does he like to do, and it was just great. 
to be able to have that information and to kind of have some fun things to know about them from the beginning, uh, um, like like the kid who had just quit smoking. I mean, that was kind of a big deal to share with us. And, and it was something that went into all of our conversations after that. Well, have you quit anything? And, uh, and then they'd say something like, well, I'm not telling you about that. But uh, then we could talk about that at, after New Year's. It was really fun. So I really love having pictures. And so, and when I think about it, it even, you know, you do that in preschool, you can do that all along the way. But this is a great way to combine a bunch of things like, um, like Ben Slavic's card talk. Well, you've kind of got card talk right in front of you. You've got technology use, you've got special person. Another thing that I try to make sure that I do is to teach tag questions. And by that, I mean the follow-up questions. So I challenge my students, once we are really rolling with these interviews, I challenge them to ask at least five different questions at the end of each slide or each major question. So an example is, and I, I give them to them the right, like the first day, what's, what's your name? Oh, okay, what's a good thing to follow up with? Um, do you like your name? And why do you like your name? Well, that's pretty difficult for a beginning student, but who gave you your name? And what does your name mean? And you can tell me in English. So there's, there's some questions that you can ask right away. When you ask a question like, where would you like to go on vacation? Why would you like, to, have you been there? Um, uh, why don't you move there instead? So kids get pretty good at that. And later on, I'm thinking I'm up oh, sub plants. So if you have taught them to do the tag questions, then it's really easy to leave the special person interview as a sub plan. You just make sure that you've got your more advanced students and you coach them, practice coaching them in advance. Those kids who can actually handle it or the students who are more advanced or less advanced. My beginning students interviewed me last year, so that isn't too much of difficulty, especially if they have the slideshow. I usually limit their time as a teacher to a couple of minutes at first, but you keep expanding that. And then, then you are sick unexpectedly, or you have to go out of town, and you just tell your sub, okay, students know how to do the special person interview. Please make sure that so-and-so takes notes and um, somebody else can create the quiz and the, the class can grade them together. But these slideshows really support them and they, um, they make it possible for you to leave that. If you have it on butcher paper around your room, I personally don't have a classroom anymore except for my house. Um, so I have no place to hang butcher paper in a room, but if you have a classroom, then you could just leave all that up all the time. Uh, the, the picture on this page was from a kid who um, did kind of tell me interesting things um, that his name, or no, um, that they had many animals in their house. They had 20 elephants and 20 dogs and lots of fish and 20 penguins and, and 2,000 crocodiles, which, uh, which information came very handy when we needed somebody to be a zookeeper in a story because we already had a zoo. So um, that's kind of off the topic of subplans, but somehow this picture made it there. All right, uh, students should always contribute to your special person, whether it's in advance. Um, I, in one of my classrooms, I had a box of, that was just on the wall and it said, um, Nasha Zvizda, our star, and people could put questions that they wanted to know about the rest of the class into there and I would add them to the slideshow and then that would become part of what we could potentially ask. Um, my slideshows ended up, like my Russian one is now something like 60 slides. And so if anybody wants that, that you can always write to me. And I'm totally, totally happy to send you an example, but most of it's already up on Bryce's. Um, ask them to share their pictures with you and you can throw that into a slideshow about them or into whatever you're doing with them. This one again is Lily and I think that Lily was saying that she likes to eat a lot of ice cream but I can't really remember so too bad I didn't write it up. 
Um, more ways to mix this up. Uh, if your class is doing something like when you ask a question about, say, video games and they just all want to talk at once, then get them all up and do an inside-outside circle or just do it that way. If you have some questions that everybody really wants to know the answer from everybody else and they won't, um, won't kind of let you interview the one person, get them up. Uh, I like to have whoever is my class secretary keep a list of the favorite songs on a back page in the notebook what the fa all the favorite songs, all the favorite movies, and how many people have said that. And then you can be playing a song when they're walking in and they're like, oh, that's my favorite song. Isn't that nice? And you're like, yeah, you already told me that. Um, or their favorite places, surprise them with pictures of their own vacation. I like doing that. Uh, really, the whole weekend chat is just another take on the special person interview. On Fridays, you say, Ooh, what are you going to do this weekend? And on Mondays, you can find out whether those people did those things. And again, Bryce has on his website a questionnaire in Spanish for Spanish teachers, not for Russian. Hey, Bryce, um, about how uh, how did you spend your weekend? Um, PQA or personalized questions and answers can always be part of your interview material and really should be. Uh, you can interview a mascot, like um, that Spanish class that I had last summer. Um, we had a little cactus out in the hall, and I brought that in, sat it on the special person chair, and asked the class to interview the cactus. And when somebody came in the next hour, and the whole class was very excited about uh, telling this person all the facts about the cactus, I think he thought that we were bonkers. But it just mixed it up, and it gave them a new way to practice. Uh, Jody Noble started this whole special person interview by comparing characters and students and interviewing them. Uh, let's see. Oh, another really good thing to do is Andrea Schweitzer's game show twist. Oh my gosh, my fourth graders are such a wonderfully rambunctious bunch and they won't, well, they do attend on special person interviews. If I ask the question, if I say, okay, how many sisters does... Uh, Guapo have, and they write their answer on a whiteboard in total silence, and then they hold them up, and then they get a certain number of points. Um, if I ask what's the favorite place, and it's some beach in Hawaii, then they could get a point for the beach and a point for Hawaii. Anyway, they really like collecting their points, and, and then we never do anything with the points, but they like having them. Uh, somebody recently has suggested using a microphone, you know, a, a reel or a plastic or, or even a toilet paper roll that's dressed up to look like a microphone. For some reason, having a microphone in your hand, it makes you feel more special. And the last thing uh, that is on this list is you can use your slides as support when you have a visitor to your class. When you want to say, okay, we're going to interview this person. And in the past, sometimes we have made up totally new things about the person or the person has actually answered the questions, but then the visitor also has the support that he or she needs to be able to know what we're talking about and doesn't feel lost or stupid, even though they're visiting a class that they might not know the language for. And if they do know the language, it's just great because there's a real person and the kids can follow along, the students can follow along a little bit more confidently than they might be able to if a visitor um, is speaking without any visual support in front of a class. All right, the last, well, I'm getting towards the end. Oh my gosh. Um, you want to feed your need. So sometimes you need to ask specific questions as I did and do with um, Russian classes that have a specific text that I'm supposed to be following, I will put those questions into the text. But if you also have specific grammar that you need to do, I guess those Russian classes did, but um, Stephen Ordiano last summer gave me some great questions like, well, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? If you were a weather, what would you be? You know, let's say you have to talk about weather ask what weather you would be. If, if you were a song, what song would you be? That's kind of a weird one, but you know what? Some people have, they, they 
feel like there's a theme song. Where would you live if you had all the money in the world? Where would you live if you had no clothing? What would you do if you saw a dog in the middle of the street? Um, when you saw a sunset for the first time, do you remember that? Um, what would you do? And then Amy Vanderdeen last, well, recently, I think, Amy, um, if you had if you could have any pet in the world, what would it be? Now, I would have a hedgehog, of course. That's why that picture is here. I love hedgehogs. Um, and then, so you can mix it up. And then the next thing to do is to really milk it. So you are going to follow up with the whole thing as you project. You're, you're going to project and you're going to type it so that students can see. So it's like write and discuss. You can ask students for the facts because you can't be on the question page and the projecting page or you can write it on the board. I like to keep a running document that eventually includes every student so that we can keep reading and um, in most of my elementary classes I have a, um, a Google Slides that I can then later print out and that has been a really nice way to make class books or to share with parents and to have for FVR libraries and then I use that random information in, in stories, as well as quizzes and cahoots and stuff. You just keep, keep running with that material. And then, like, I like to interview one person every day, if possible, and keep the information on that person going. And then, you know, when it cycles back around, and I've come to that next, the same kid, later on, we can review what we already know about that student. We can read the document that already exists and then ask a few more questions and add to the information. So that's basically what this slide is about. Um, and later on, when you're reading about them, then you can actually add details that the kids themselves know. Sometimes the star of the day will come up and I'll say, oh, we were supposed to interview so-and-so, and then they'll say, oh, but we know more about him. So even though he's absent, we can, add some information and that's pretty funny when the kid comes back and then he's going no not true at all so there really are more ways to do a special person interview and to follow it up than there are teachers i ended up using in my university beginning russian class um, bill van patten's discourse scramble which means that you take a paragraph you lay it all out in sentences and then you cut it apart and people have to put it back together in a logical form and I took one of our special person interviews from a student who was actually auditing so that it didn't matter that she was seeing her own information and I asked them to put it in order and students really had a lot of fun with that they said this is the first time we've had a craft project for our final exam in a university class they liked it a lot and it turned out to be really easy for me to grade uh, for reasons I can go into at a different time but the, the only thing that I hadn't done was I really had not done very many discourse scrambles with them. I'd done it sort of in a fashion on Kahoot. I would recommend doing a discourse scramble or six maybe before putting it as part of a final exam because it really terrifies people to see something they've never had to do before. So um, let's see. Oh, if you need more ideas, go, go to any of the Comprehensible Input Facebook pages and just Google special person or star of the day and you will see so many cool ideas that you will have too many and you will have to stop reading like I do. Okay, back to those facts. The only thing that you have to do when you are using a special person interview is that you need to remember to establish meaning however you do it, make it really easy for students to, to know that they are with you, check the comprehension, go slowly, point and pause, repeat, 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 whatever ways you do it, and truly be interested. And then you will be able to enjoy the interviews, you'll be able to build community, you will love your students even more than you already do, and share yourself, and you will be a star and you can write oh you can write to me at any time Michelle with one L only one J Whaley only one L I'm whale with a tail at gmail.com and I'm supposed to stop sharing and open up the Q&A box and there's only one question 
Ah, let's see. There is a question that is regarding questioning the class. How can I make high schoolers accountable for listening, responding when the class is questioned? Well, okay. So I, um, Bryce has a lot of ideas about this on his website and you are welcome to do that. My husband is cooking. Um, you are welcome to look at that. Um, his answers, oh, I can check the answer questions. Okay. Um, uh, he actually has students take notes. And so he has people take notes and then they talk to each other about the notes and then he gives them quizzes. <laughs> Um, so he gives them quizzes on this and they have to write a certain number of points and actually he's done a blog post on his post lately that I mean on his website lately that talks about how he used to end up with people having way too many points so that now they can only get I don't know 25 points per essay or something uh, numbers are bad for me so go check it out go find out what he has there um, I I don't know. I, I don't know why, but I have never had trouble having people pay attention in classes except for those fourth graders. So, you know, it's perhaps you want to have them write things out. Oh, I know. I saw on Facebook <laughs> on one of the CI groups, I saw yet one more thing um, that somebody had a template that she filled out for the questions that, or that she created for all the questions that she was going to be asking that day. And then kids just had to fill in the answers as they heard them. That's a lot of work for me. I'm lazy. And so um, one of the ways that I make, well, right now my third graders are really into drawing so that when we're doing a special person interview, I ask them to draw a picture that represents each of the bits of information that we learn about somebody, whether, and then they do like one side for the person who's the special person and one side that is about other people they learn about in the class during the course of comparing. And then I ask them to sit in pairs and point to the information as I discuss it. So like um, after we're done, I'll say, okay, uh, where was, uh, where did Amanda go on vacation last summer? And everybody's supposed to point at the picture. And I say, are you pointing at, um, at Ecuador? And, you know, if you're not pointing at Ecuador, then that's a problem. So, um, let's see. Okay. Oh, one. Okay. I think, let's see. Um, do I ask the same questions of all my students? That's a really good question. Um, I have the same slideshow, and I am likely to ask the same questions in the beginning. But I, like for my Russian classes, like I said, I've got like 62 or 65 different questions. So we don't make it through all of the questions for everybody ever. We might do, um, like, it depends on how long we're talking about a topic and how many tag questions we get to and that is a reason for me to have um, to have that running document go and so that way I know which things we have answered and which things we haven't right okay oh seven questions were answered yay um, so that sort of looks like oh there's chat goodness okay Looks like everything is good. Um, who was I just answering? Open, it says to. Okay, so Cynthia, did I answer your question enough? Do you ask the same questions of all your students? In the beginning, I definitely do, because I want them to hear the same basic things. Where, where do you live? Where did you live? Where did you come from? And I don't want to expand too much on all of the other sorts of questions that students might want to answer or might 
might be able to answer. It's too confusing. Yes. Oh, I see. You're thinking that asking the question, the, exactly the same questions would help the shy kids. Yeah, it, it does. Keep in mind that if somebody is pretty shy, I'm going to go slower and I'm going to go more gently and I'm going to make sure that I'm pointing and pausing a lot. And I also, um, sometimes like um, the young lady who was in the picture of the beginning class, um, she said, oh, but you're filming and I don't want to be filmed. And I said, you know what? You don't even have to talk. I'll just ask the questions and then the rest of the class can answer and you can nod or shake your head. Well, she ended up talking a whole bunch, but she didn't feel like she had to then. So I'm thinking that we're good. And it looks like I just need to say goodbye. Thank you all for coming. It was really fun for me to do this. And I hope I get to see you in person. Love to you all.